individuals. Uh, I, my full name is Esther Parker, but uh, people remember me by Terry. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, my outline will be about first how the state of our uh, marine resources requires a more integrated approach to our resource management and some of the initiatives which needs to be dovetailed with some of the sustainable development concerns. And I would like to introduce you to some tools which will help us understand and communicate some of the challenges which are present in uh, the ecosystem management of our areas. And hopefully we are able to see some opportunities to link biodiversity conservation to fisheries management. So uh, the integrated coastal management uh, approach has been uh, enacted in some of the legislation that we have, especially in the Executive Order 533. And this also dovetails with uh, the National Plan of Action uh, in the Coral Triangle Initiative goal, which relates some of the uh, sustainable development concerns such as food security, sustainable livelihood, poverty alleviation, and which also puts into context some of the coral reef challenges that we are wanting to deal with, such as uh, a seascape approach to fisheries and also ecosystems and also, for example, addressing MPAs and uh, at the same time, sustainable fisheries management and also climate change uh, concerns and, of course, threatened species. So, uh, some of the approaches that we are looking at is either through the pressure state response model, root cost analysis, and from here deriving some general programs of action. Uh, but in some national programs, such as the ICRMP, it tries to dovetail with the national plan of action of the Coral Triangle by looking at the four goals, which is MPA and MPA networks, and ecosystem approach to fisheries management and threatened species. By coming up with interventions related to coastal resource management zoning uh, and also having a seascape approach towards, for example, conservation at the national and regional level. So we are given the opportunity by having various tools available now which can help us understand at the same time lead us to some decisions which will help clarify and identify problems so that we can come up with best strategies and decisions. So for example, the state of our ecosystem shows that there's a tremendous gap between what we are doing in our archipelagic country where if we notice that there are there's nearly over six times the uh, territorial sea, including the EEZ, as compared to the uh, land area. And so you can see that uh, there maybe perhaps with the gaps that we see, many of our let's say coral reef areas are now in very poor condition. And we can see that uh, this gives us a low uh, productivity. And we will see also that this is an example of what we call fishing down the food chain, wherein there are only very few areas which have top predators. And there have been many reports where it, it has shown that you know the groupers and the sharks have already disappeared or have been locally extirpated. So these are some of the uh, fishing activities which we experience. And we can see that through the years, 
the Philippines has been experiencing a decline in fish food productivity and we are experiencing food deficits. This has been projected in the past and uh, was by Bernasek in 2010 that we would have been experiencing food deficits. We can see also that the fishers are the poorest of the food poor sector in the Philippines. Uh, in, so we can see that it has the highest poverty incidence and perhaps it is also because we have failed to uh, rein on or manage our fisheries resources. So in the 1980s, we can see that there are only a f there are few heavily exploited areas or over exploited areas, but in the mid 2000s, we can see that these areas are now. Uh, in most parts of the country. And to give you an idea of what is the situation in, for example, in a heavily overexploited area such as this. Uh, this is uh, in Bohol. We can see that there is a high density of fissure per square kilo uh, per, uh, kilometer of coastline. And uh, in some of our recent work, we have shown that around 20% uh, of the species diversity have been reduced in the Visayas region as compared to the 19, early 1950s. This is a very fast decline as compared to what it might have been in the uh, 1950s. So this is, a, this is what I mean by the profound reduction of productivity. This is around over 40 tons of per square kilometers of fish, which is now only existent in around 2% to 5% of our country. Aside from the overfishing threats, our efforts in uh, marine conservation, especially the establishment of uh, NPAs have become uh, like a sentinel for us to see how well we are doing in trying to manage our fisheries resources but at the same time our coastal ecosystems. Especially uh, within the impending climate change challenge we, which we see is becoming or exacerbated by the overfishing situation. So uh, we have been also uh, looked at as a model for the region to see how we are trying to look at dealing with the climate change challenge together with fisheries management and conservation. So one of the ways where we can look at these uh, various choices that we need to deal work with is trying to see what are the costs and the benefits in relation to how much how much uh, it would cost to allocate for example areas for protection but at the same time sustaining benefits from sustainable fishing effort uh, fishing activity so we have we can see that for example, some of the highly overfished areas that we have estimated and those which are underfished are required that we would need to have around 50% of our areas to be uh, protected. Of course, we all know that this might be an impossible task. So how do we merge the dilemma or deal with the dilemma of regulating fishing but at the same time continue to feed our poor and hungry population. At the same time, we are given uh, oscillating uh, perturbations such as the climate change effects like for example the Niño which affects the productivity of our ocean and if we 
see that these are overfished, then it will not be able to recover from such bleaching events. So in the recent years of ice cream, we have been able to show that if the fisheries is not as stressed, it's able to bounce back. But if there are more frequent, let's say, the linear events which cause bleaching, that together with exacerbated effects of uh, nutrification and sedimentation, then it will jeopardize its recovery. So in effect, we look at areas wherein we can see the important considerations of how how much to protect in terms of biodiversity or uh, species diversity, but at the same time also look at the cost of uh, this effort, the management cost. So there are decision support tools like MarkSan, but there are also uh, which have embedded you know cost of management to these uh, decisions, but at the same time. There are also more simple tools which you can utilize in order to decide priority biodiversity conservation areas, but incorporating, for example, tools like the fisheries information to sustain harvest, where it looks at, for example, as I mentioned, how much is the fishing capacity in an area and how much. Uh, Will the fishery system be able to uh, sustain in relation to this fishery catch relative to the effort being uh, put in by a certain amount of fisher population? So this is an example where we can show the the benefits of deciding how much you will allocate for protection at the same time how much fishers can be uh, sustained. That is in relation to, for example, single NPAs, but it, these are just an example of some of the priority base that we have been looking at in relation to the various fishing effort that has been exerted. And it shows that aside from single MPAs, it's very important to look at, for example, regulating effort of various municipalities which are under uh, uh, joint alliance, for example, of uh, within the bay. So we have what is called the Fish B2 model, which looks at the advantages of working together as a network. And we can show that there are uh, good benefits which can be derived from looking at working together. So here, aside from looking at the uh, sort of fisheries regimes that needs to be regulated, Allocating areas which are protected will actually also regulate fishing effort. And uh, some of the approaches which are incorporated are utilizing the biogeographic regions and looking at marine corridors, which are now the priority areas which are being managed for through the ICRMP. And also uh, areas which are uh, identified, for example, for uh, high priority, and this has now been further developed under the Conservation International by looking at marine KBAs, but uh, to merge with efforts in relation to threatened species or actually uh, what they call trigger species. In addition, uh, some of the indications of the effects of upland uh, poor land uses show that you know uh, both sewage and poor land use, such as erosion leading to siltation, uh, has affected many of the protected areas.
So in effect, we have to also look at the integration of the land and sea efforts. So we also utilize various uh, models to illustrate what uh, improvement of various land uses can reduce, for example, uh, siltation and sewage effects in the area. We, the, this uh, investigations need to be also fed back to the local governments and stakeholders, and it would be good if there is an institutional mechanism for this uh, completing the feedback cycle, such as by establishing knowledge-based committees and networks wherein universities are able to engage with both the local government and stakeholders. One of the ways wherein we can document this is through the, the state of the post report, which is now also being adopted in the Coral Triangle, wherein there's a state of the Coral Triangle report. And it also incorporates fisheries as one of the major issues. So one of the networks, aside from the social network in relation to the network of practitioners, is also uh, combining the ecological base uh, relationships of MPAs and uh, fish, which would swim around the MPAs is through combining governance measures by setting up NPA networks through uh, inter-LGU alliances, which here will show you that with joint efforts, they can also show improvements uh, in both enforcement by showing declines in uh, violations, but at the same time improvement in the fisheries. I mean, in the standing stock of the associated fish. So with this, we are also helping shepherd with the field reefs, Philippine Coral Reef Information Network, which uh, wherein the database is uh, viewable on the web and maintained in the Marine Science Institute through the uh, MIDAS Marine Information Data Acquisition System. Uh, which was established through the USD Picamar grant. So, aside from uh, the information networks, we can also provide incentives by sharing forums, and the network becomes a learning exchange of information, uh, wherein there are incentives through uh, awards for good practices. So we have been helping the MPA support network to also recognize good practices. At the same time, provide a venue for people to engage in reporting. For example, this is uh, was held last year to enjoin uh, people in the Facebook to report incidents of bleaching and what they have observed in the area. As I mentioned, there are also some indications that all is not necessarily all bad, but we have to see that we have to make sure that when there are declines in stocks, these stocks are able to bounce back. So for example, in Cebu area, we have seen an increase in terms of the swarms in the recent years, around 2007. And this, we also relate to the oscillations in the El Nino phenomena, El Nino La Nina phenomena, which we also saw in the pelagic realm. So this is a similar species of sardines, and this has been uh, projected to be changing, as mentioned here, shifts between anchovies to sardines in decadal time scales. But they are saying that reducing fishery, fishing mortality, meaning to say 
uh, you have to regulate fishing so that the oscillations will allow it to recover. This is also um, also demonstrated by some of our long-term monitoring of the sites wherein we see that in areas which are better protected, the fish stocks are able to bounce back in terms of uh, perturbations. But here, for example, the magnitude of differences are actually great. Like for example, if you start with a better uh, fisheries or standing stock of reef associated fish, you are able to get increases higher. So you will see that this has a maximum of around 30 tons, whereas here it reaches around 80 to 100 tons. So in effect, the protecting our ecosystems, like for example here, we demonstrated that if you are able to manage the, this reef better, it is able to cope with sea level changes and it is able to provide the protection for the coastal areas. At the same time, also if we maintain our the health of our reefs, then it will be able to provide opportunities to enhance and replenish. So some of our sanctuaries in a, in our research station have been an area for stock enhancement. So when some of the sea urchins have been reduced to very low numbers, now it has bounced back to what was uh, in the early 1980s and 90s period. Again, what is important is also to be able to communicate and to continue the monitoring by engaging with local communities, by translating this the monitoring and evaluation efforts in some of the manuals that we have uh, sort of developed so that we can continue the adaptive management cycle. And so this can redound to benefits to fishers and to happy people. <laughs> anyway, uh, we also need to continue the incentives available for uh, local communities to be recognized. And one of the ways to also help continue this uh, knowledge is to have databases at the same time uh, integrate both the social <coughs> networks and the ecological networks so that we are able to find resilience and adaptability in a changing world. So in effect, what is important is that we see opportunities to integrate good governance practices such as areas wherein we work together among uh, various local government uh, hierarchies and also stakeholders. We also see that MPAs not only as a conservation strategy is a good entry point towards an ecosystem approach to fisheries management. And there are decision support tools which are available for us to be able to engage with knowledge-based communities so that we find synergies to be able to accelerate our efforts towards sustainable development. I think uh, I welcome some inputs and questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anita. The floor is now open to our audience for your comments or your questions for Dr. Anita. Any questions or comments? While you're, uh, uh, yes, Dr. Cadiz. Thank you for that. Uh, wow, that's, that's uh, really a failed presentation. But on the last, the, the previous to uh, this slide, the third bullet, do you have a case of application of DSS tools? Uh, 
is there a, a story perhaps that you may tell us on how this has been um, used in any of your projects? Actually, the I don't know. Then do you bring our toolkit? No, we all left it. Yeah, we we have a pro project. That's why uh, I was going to show this in the EBM tools demonstration in uh, in this project last year. We actually had engaged with ten municipalities for in. We try to demonstrate to them some of the fishing tools, but at the same time uh, engage them in games wherein they are able to make uh, choices, for example, to set up MPAs or to invest in agriculture. So these are tools which uh, provides them a process of engagement with the local communities. But in the process, they were able to identify areas wherein they thought that they should be able to regulate uh, their fishing effort. For example, in Lubang, the two municipalities decided that they will need to uh, stop some of the licensing of their piles for commercial fishing. So that's one. Aside from that, they had a joint activity between uh, Lubang and Lok to come up with a joint uh, sort of management of one of their large sort of sanctuaries, which is a thousand hectares, one of the biggest uh, sanctuaries that they declare jointly. Uh, in other areas, uh, for example, in Aurora, they actually, since they still established MPAs because they felt that it would help them sort of uh, have some um, access arrangements wherein they are controlling the stewardship of the MPAs nearby because many of the uh, fishing that they are engaging in Aurora is more offshore towards tuna fishing. So that's one of the sort of indications that some of the tools are being used. Uh, but some of the other tools which I showed you, like for example Mark Sand, are being utilized in a top-down approach. So that some it really depends how they are utilized. For example, who is engaging uh, in relation to the decision makers who are making the choices and the policy interventions. Like for example, the reef game that we uh, use are mainly targeted for fishers, but in a separate situation, the sim reef which targeted actually the like uh, the management body in the Yucatan Peninsula, so that's a higher level of uh, sort of intervention that they are looking at. So it depends on who, what is the governance system in the area that utilizes some of the tools. Any more questions or comments? Yes, Dr. Murka. I am Lin I am in uh, agriculture. Uh, thank you for the nice presentation and, and bringing all the problems that uh, you encounter. I know that you're a scientist, but uh, what I see is that uh, the, there should be rehabilitation. Now you are doing it scientifically based on your uh, uh, science. But uh, how about the rehabilitation, the social rehabilitation of the poor? Because the poor people who are research, they are the ones that uh, continuously uh, managing or uh, disrupting the uh, ecological build up of uh, what you're trying to rehabilitate. You, you are right that that actually remains to be a major challenge, but there are actually some efforts that we have shown in relation to some of the stock enhancement efforts 
uh, I've mentioned to you that um, in our research station, our local partners are actually receiving uh, depleted stocks of high value invertebrates like sea urchins and sea cucumbers. So these are not only in terms of theoretical or scientific investigations, but these provide actual uh, benefits in relation to build up of uh, the fishery stocks. Uh, in some areas, for example, like uh, I was showing you in El Nido, I think uh, some of the benefits which we've shown is that it is able to bounce back as compared to areas which are highly stressed. So to some extent, the estimates for the uh, social economic benefits are more, as you said, theoretical, but the cost of doing nothing is also much greater sometimes. But uh, in terms of actual social, you are right that we need to engage with the social development aspects. Unfortunately, our institute is, is more of a natural science institute. So we actually engage with, like for example, people like Debbie who are more with the social science realm. And I, actually, I just came from a meeting with some development uh, organizations which are looking at, for example, the institutional uh, relationships of, of LGUs and also the as social marketing aspects. But uh, basically, we try to do the best we can with our competencies and collaborate with other partners to go and do the more social development concerns. Any more questions or comments from our audience? Yes, Papa. Yes, Papa. Yes, Papa. About 10 years ago, I used to go to with my wife to Batangas uh, to get her daughter yes. because uh, yes. she's uh, doing some research in lead teams. Okay, but yes. uh, after going back there the second time, then there are no more You're right. And they were saying that uh, there was a buyer. So people uh, just pick them up. But uh, the thing is that if you are in research, just like my wife, then uh, several civil permits are needed to get this sample of auditorium yes. to see. But the partners, uh, users, they just pick them up and sell them. They don't, somehow they are accepted from the buyer prospecting. So yeah. how do you solve these things? Yeah, in the whole development trajectory, the, aside from the gap in terms of the studies, I think the, the marine realm is still in the hunting-gatherer stage and we are starting towards, uh, for example, dealing with concerns of mariculture, but there is also a transformation from, let's say, and that's why instead of being just purely hunter-gatherer, the protected areas provide the experience for fishers to be able to be stewards of a particular area, thus providing the, them the opportunity to learn and experience and transform their behavior towards more of a, you know, a less of an open access situation. Uh, also, with the various coastal zoning efforts uh, through the Executive Order 533, which identifies various zones, for example, in relation to fishing, uh, multiple use zones, and also navigation zones, industrial zones, and other concerns like recreation, uh, are starting to be developed. That's why we are saying that we are trying to look at it from an ecosystem approach. But uh, the actual success of this integrated approach 
is only beginning to unfold because uh, we have to be able to, as you said, uh, not only transform the minds of our unconvinced, but also we have to build like the enabling environments for, for example, for fishers, but also even for land use uh, efforts, but also in, in terms of the sea use areas. Hi, Bear. Um, you, you presented data about um, high, high biodiversity areas that could be uh, more resilient than others when there are some perturbations. Like um, today, we brought a lot of students here, and I think it is nice if you can provide us some insights what makes high biodiversity areas more resilient than others which have a lower uh, yeah. diversity. Thank you. I think uh, maybe Dr. Loman has uh, discussed with you, you know, the various theories in relation to the importance of having uh, biodiversity resilience uh, in the ecosystem. I mean to say, well, this is also scale dependent because there is, for example, the redundancy theory. So for example, if you have a, a function of some species which gets offset or they are extirpated, then at least you have some areas, uh, some species which would be able to uh, take over as like, for example, redundancies. But at the same time, I was saying the scale of uh, the diversity depends also on the range of the distribution of species. So you might have a lot of species, but the ecosystems are very fragmented. Then it would not be able to be able to, let's say, provide uh, sufficient uh, population size to meet or to uh, repopulate. So the, the scale and the connectedness of this uh, sort of biodiversity attributes both at the species and the habitat level is very important. But at the same time, the connectivity is not only dependent on how the fish are able to exchange their gametes, but also dependent on the biophysical attributes. But uh, when you say that there are perturbations, it also depends on the degree of exposure. Like for example, in some, in the recent El Nino event, you can have short but very uh, large thermal anomalies which can profoundly kill some corals. But at least if there are areas which have not been hit, then at least it would provide replenishment for the, the propagules of some of these species. So that's why it's important to also have a scale consideration in terms of management so that uh, they, you are able to facilitate the exchange of replenishment from other areas which are not affected. I think uh, many of the agriculture people would have already learned this experience a couple, perhaps decades ago when they are coming up with farming systems when you uh, allow systems to follow or rest so that it will also provide uh, sort of uh, recovery. But at the same time in the land systems there are what is called integrated social forestry in the also look at the exchange of various uh, materials. So biodiversity at the species level and at uh, functional diversity, for example, uh, maybe Toto has told you about the problem of having, like for example, trophy cascades where in the various, let's say, herbivores are depleted. 
so that if you already fish out, for example, the dangit and the murmur, when the, the algae takes over, then it does not control, I mean, it that doesn't get uh, raised on by the herbivores. So in effect, it will not be able to facilitate the recovery of the leaves because settlement will be jeopardized. So these are various levels of biodiversity uh, functionalities which can affect the resiliency of, uh, like, like for example, leaves. So that's why it's important to have uh, the biodiversity attributes be maintained. Any more questions from our staff? Dr. Nardisha? Oh, thank you, Dr. Renew, for that very interesting uh, discussion. I would like to ask uh, something uh, from your group in the Marine Institute. Uh, one of my uh, graduating students at Arendal University in the College of Forestry had a research on the species, marine, the mangrove species found or found growing at various, uh, various uh, depth of the sea and uh, distance from the shore. Uh, how how far is there? Is there uh, some research uh, by the marine still on this aspect? So that I would like to believe that. Uh, some fish would prefer the shallow uh, as breeding breeding area places this the, the shallow uh, water and some fishes might prefer the deeper uh, so that the deeper uh, uh, what sea so it is possible that uh, if you what you call this follow the line this uh, ecosystem approach, as you say, probably we would increase uh, both the what the product from the mangrove and product from the sea. And the you are right, uh, Doctor Arisha. Yeah. Uh, well, some of the sort of mangrove research uh, are actually what we done here. But uh, the associated fish species, there are some studies, like for example, one of my graduate students just finished. It showed that, for example, similar to the mangroves, which moves from one habitat to, other, to another, like the sabalu is way out there in the ocean, and it moves later on when it spawns. Uh, the, there are grouper species also, and there are some uh, palakito, which moves, and also the mga snapper, which moves in different parts of the, let's say, reef, seagrass, and mangrove areas. And indeed, uh, for example, the fishery, for example, which tries to catch, for example, the fry, can actually uh, reduce the the stocks profoundly by, the, uh, by taking them at their early stages. Aside from the trawling activity which catches the, the large uh, spawners, like for example the lapu-lapu, the bigger size lapu-lapu are actually uh, males who are in actually before they start being a female and then they shift. Can you imagine we will, if all the Big males have been already repeated and have a very lonely female population. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so in, in effect, if you were to design a network of protected areas, you would have to also have representativeness, I mean to say not only representativeness of species, but representativeness of habitats. So for example, many of the Marine sanctuary efforts are mainly in coral reef areas, which are now looking at connecting this to the seagrass and mangrove areas because 
like for example the gangit moves from the seagrass to the coral reef and then when they come back they also land in the seagrass area so sometimes they are not protected mainly because of the uh, preferences of scientists mainly because they like the coral reef because the mangrove is maputi <laughs> But yes, indeed, it's very important to consider uh, representativeness of the habitats, connectivity, and as I said, resiliency features. We can see whether, uh, what are the attributes to help make it bounce back as quickly as possible. Any more questions or comments for Dr. Anino? By the way, uh, Dr. Anino will be uh, making his PowerPoint, a PDF copy of his PowerPoint, available in the Circle website. So you can download it starting Thursday. Any more questions or comments from our students? Anyone? Yes, Dr. Murga. I know that uh, when you do the work, then you are having funds or projects. Fun but, uh, or funds? Funds. <laughs> funds. <laughs> but uh, I know that uh, you also have fun when you put ah, funds. But uh, and the, with the global government duty, when you go down there and you are getting population, uh, do they get uh, money from uh, the revenue allotment or uh, do they source uh, uh, from other uh, places? To, uh, to do uh, some uh, competition work. Yes. Let's see. Yeah, it's important to, you know, in the era, there is also the Economic Development Fund. So they also get to get some parts of it. But you will be surprised that actually in many of the areas which we have collaborated with, that they are able to afford more than many of the, let's say, national government agencies in relation to funding, in relation to conservation and uh, resource management. But, uh, of course, there are constraints for poor local governments. But uh, you, you are also surprised, I mean, maybe you are saying, I don't know, you are trying to allude to some other things. But in actuality, there is a whole range of funds from intelligence funds to wetting funds or whatever. But what I'm saying is, of course, there are better ways to be able to use funds if you are able to convince local governments that it is worth uh, the, their sort of uh, effort. No? Uh, I think you know, that's where, like, for example, good that I've met Cell because they are able to help communicate this sort of sort of maybe complex concerns especially I have a difficulty of communicating some of these things that uh, it's sometimes very important that local governments and stakeholders are able to understand but also move them to action. But yes, there are actually funds which are available in many years. So you can also see that there has been an increase from, let's say, maybe before 100,000 every per year. On the average, many of the LGUs are investing around 300,000 for their local centuries. I think we have time for one more question. Any questions from our audience? Or comments? Okay, at this point, can we give uh, Dr. Arminio another round of applause?